G'day everyone and welcome to Roger Williams Park Zoo here in good old-fashioned Rhode Island. I'm your host, Nicholas Lionreuter, and today I'm joined with uh, a returning co-host. Uh, we have Dill returning uh, once again. Hi guys. What's uh, up? I, I can't do an accent. <laughs> so uh, Dill is, uh, you know, a, a very frequent uh, co-host on the channel. Uh, he was in the Talkin' episode as well as the Gibbon and a few other videos that I've had. Um, but uh, a new co-host that we have today is Trico. And I can also do an accent. Oh, g'day! Um, th welcome to the video! See, yeah. this is actually funny because Trico's actually Australian. And that yeah, is the main reason... My... That is the main reason I've brought him, because he is my local Australian friend. Um, and my actual Australian accent is probably worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I'm not even going to beat around the bush with this. Uh, this is technically the third time we've recorded this video. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the, the first two... One was good. Was good. It yeah. was comedy gold. Yeah, the second one was pretty solid. Uh, first one was okay. We got some of the conversation topics in mind. Uh, but, uh, you know, we uh, had some interruptions, but we are back, and third time's the charm. Uh, yep. So, uh, I guess I'll, uh, you know, just go over what I'm doing. So, um, as you can see, I'm working on a turtle right now, because it is actually a terrapin, which uh, is the actual, the diamondback terrapin is actually the turtle we are getting in the aquatic pack. And... Before I made this, I didn't even realize that we were getting a diamond pack terrapin wall sign. That is, you know, probably would have been better. But, you know, this one's more accurate to the actual one in the zoo. And that is because this one is in World of Adaptations and is a uh, differences between tortoises and turtles sign. So, uh, we, we've done some back and forth in the, the first two recordings and we basically have deduced that this tortoise is most likely the radiated tortoise, which is also in World of Adaptations, though it probably could be anything else because the zoo doesn't actually have diamondback terrapins. Um, actually, I don't think we have many turtles in the entire zoo. We have a lot of tortoises, but we only have one type of turtle, and that is the snake neck turtle. Uh, and that is located in the Emerald Tree Boa exhibit. Um, so, basically what I'm working on for this episode, uh, for the most part, is going to be the murals, uh, for all of Worlds of Adaptation's indoor building, as well as the wallaby enclosure, which, like I said, gotta love wallabies. Yeah. Yeah, guess, guess what kind of enclosure it is. Well, uh, well, well what it will be, because it will be a kangaroo walkabout with wallabies someday, huh? Yes! Yeah. Yes! Which what is a, a great thing to replace uh, two very rare animals for the area with. Yeah. <laughs> so we will be Crikey. getting into that. Because let me go into a little bit of a, a history lesson of, of the Australian animals at Roger Williams Park Zoo. So back in the day, uh, as I was growing up, we had emus and gray can eastern gray kangaroos located over where Faces of the Rainforest is currently. So that was a basically just a field with emus and kangaroos and you could barely see them because it was so heavily, you know, covered in plants and foliage that you couldn't see them at all. Um, I remember that, yeah. So it was a really bad enclosure, uh, but then they one day said, I have a great idea, guys. What if we did a kangaroo walkabout? You could go in and see the kangaroos and wallabies, and everyone's How revolutionary. like, and I and I'm pretty sure that you know Roger Williams Ghost himself came out and said this is a great idea. I don't think any zoo has ever done it before, and so we added the kangaroo walkabout, and then in less than a year they demolished it. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Basically, they demolished it, and I think that's be the beginning of when they started working on Face of the Rainforest as we know it, um, which it's now standing. But it, in doing so, we lost our eastern gray kangaroos and emus. So, you know, you might be thinking, oh, so, well, you know, what, what's the plan then? Or, you know, are, are we just never going to see them again? No, in the master plan, we are getting kangaroos back, and they're going to bring back the walkabout. But instead, they're going to demolish the Babarusa, the 
which Julie will be happy about, the uh, the North American River Otter, the King Vulture, and the Binturong. All I'm so not that pissed at that about that at all, guys. Yes. Yeah, so we're gonna have an amazing, an amazing walkabout, kind of like the one at Trico's local zoo. Mm. The Australia Zoo. Like, just a quick little thing. It's. I think it's totally fine to have, like, a kangaroo walkabout in, like, a zoo that isn't in Australia, obviously, because people might be like, oh, kangaroo, that's an Australian thing. It feels like you're just in Australia. But why would you need to have one in Australia Zoo? Because I can just go outside, walk, like, a kilometer or two away, and I'll probably see a grey kangaroo. Whereas my local zoo, Australia Zoo, home of the crocodile hunter, Steve with g'day, crikey, there's gonna, the, like, there's a huge enclosure with just grey kangaroos and a couple of wallaby. Oh, and also there's, like, an echidna area, but that's, it's weird. <laughs> it's just, like, it's just full of animals that you can already see here. It's, it's just, like, for the tourists. That's pretty much it. That's all the zoo's for. But... Whoa, who is this handsome devil? Why, that's actually a picture of me! That's right, Nicholas Lionrider, in the flesh! Um, that in is... The <laughs> in the pixels! In the pixels! Um, basically this is a, uh, a photo that I use often for creating my murals. It's my high school graduation photo that I recreated out of pixel art. And so I turn it into, um, you know, my basic, you know, uh, pixel art template for like my grid uh, whenever I do like any of my art pieces and uh, I do a lot of art pieces in this episode like I was mentioning it before um, we are going to be doing all of the exhibit backdrops so these are all the murals that are inside of World of Adaptations uh, so the first one that I'm doing right now is the tree kangaroo enclosure um, so in the first two recordings this is usually where we were interrupted hopefully cross fingers crossed we don't but um, in our first uh, video, we were basically wondering like where tree kangaroos were even from because I wasn't actually sure if they were really found in many areas of Australia. And we basically have deduced that for the most part, they're actually kind of in the like Indonesian islands surrounding Australia and stuff of that nature. Uh, though they are probably in uh, actual Australian rainforests and stuff of uh, yeah. Places most like that. commonly, I think. Most commonly, I think just a couple of subspecies are found in the Dane tree, but most of them are found in like Indonesia, like Papua New Guinea, Sumatra, those kind of places. Yeah. Yep. And then I remember um, we were also discussing how, weirdly enough, so uh, like Trico said, he's from you know uh, Queensland, which is home to the crocodile hunter, aka Steve Irwin, and Australia Zoo is kind of a, a zoo that's a bit of a tourist destination yeah. and basically because it's it's a zoo based around australian animals basically it's all like hey you want to go see a crocodile or a kangaroo hold a koala you you know you go to australia zoo um yeah. i think i described it the best by saying that it's like a roadside zoo but the road is named after them <laughs> because you go the, the way you go to australia zoo you go off a highway can't remember which one onto the road called Steve Irwin Way, which takes you to Australia Zoo, home of the Crocodile Hunter. So, yeah, it's just like a glorified roadside zoo that's famous enough to have its road named after. That's pretty much it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and so, like, we were discussing, like, uh, you know, they have all these uh, famous Australian animals, like wombats and Tasmanian devils and, uh, like, you know, crocodiles, obviously. But, weirdly enough, they don't have any tree kangaroos, which I was kind of surprised about, because I was like, wouldn't, like, you know, the zoo literally named Australia Zoo native, you know, with all these native species have them? But apparently not, and I thought that was yeah. really weird. Um, I think they make up for it in the hundreds of other Australian animals they have, though. <laughs> and then but, they have yeah, the, the, they random, have. the random tiger subspecies that... You know, oh, they're definitely pure bangles, right? Yeah, oh my yeah. God. yeah and then the pure bangles. And then the giraffes and the zebras that you can barely see because the viewing is very much focused towards the giraffes, which means you just cannot see the zebras. And the enclosure is again, this might be a current, a reoccurring theme, a big grass field, and they can just like go very far away from where you can view them. 
So you can see the giraffe's okay, like a, a couple of pixels if you take a photo, but the zebra is like marginally smaller, so you have to have like your own binoculars to go and see him. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're gonna go to Australia to like go to the zoo, don't go to Australia. Don't go there. It's in the middle of Tarunga. nowhere. Yeah, go like, I... Go to Tarunga Zoo. Yeah, because obviously, like, I... I pretty close, too, so you could do both of them. The Australian yeah. Zoo's in the middle of nowhere. Or just catch a flight to Western Plains if you don't want to go to Sydney. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, while we were discussing that entire thing, we totally missed... Uh, I, I did the entire Komodo Dragon uh, mural as well. Uh, and then I mess up here because I accidentally add a lake, which is part of the radiated tortoise mural because I was looking at the wrong reference image. But I fix it here because uh, we are about to do the radiated tortoise thing. Like I said, about 50% of this video is me literally doing murals. And I'm not sure if people want me to put these on the workshop because I don't know if, you know, that's a thing that people would be interested in. Um, obviously, I know that with the aquatic update, we're getting official murals uh, being added. But, you know, I, I feel like, you know, for some people, they're still going to, you know, want some uh, custom looking ones. But, you know, I'll have to see. So, uh, I don't know. Leave in the comments if you want me to make these murals public on the workshop or anything. Or uh, just in general, like anything at Roger Williams. Because I have a lot of stuff at Roger Williams that I don't know if people would like to see on the workshop. But... Um, yeah, I just thought I'd throw that out there, just for the people watching. Um, oh, I don't even know what I'm doing. Oh yeah, so I'm working on the, uh, radiated tortoise, uh, backdrop, which is basically, like, a few different mountains in, like, a valley surrounding this lake, uh, that I'm making right now. So I'm just kind of outlining what I want. And just to save on, um, some of the... Uh, what's it called the like actual memory of the game and you know making sure that the piece count is sort of low I made sure that the backdrop of the sky was literally just like a painted plaster wall <laughs> So that I wasn't like literally just trying to Completely, you know crash my game because world of adaptations now I'm sure is a bit taxing with the amount of pieces are that are you know located with all these murals and stuff but uh I, I do think the, the murals and the fonts and the aquatic update are gonna really help with like piece count in like smaller in like zoos for, for people with maybe le medium to low end computers because like you have to the only font you have is the planet zoo font now and it's not really that versatile having the like just blank I guess aerial font I think that's gonna really help along with like the um, I think it's gonna be, uh, like, the Arctic mountain E one well, Antarctic mountain E ones and then, like, the forest E one I think they're gonna really help instead of having these, like, pixel things. Though variation is always good, it's still just, like, the more official things, the better, as I think Nick has said. Yeah, exactly, like, um, I, I discussed it a little bit in, like, my actual, like, uh, kind of overview of the uh aquatic update and stuff i'm more or less happy with you know everything being official now and not needing to be whatever uh so what i'm doing right now uh i quickly wanted to correct something that i i did last episode so san who was in the first uh world of adaptations episode actually pointed this out that the um wrinkled hornbill enclosure that i made uh actually has a skylight and so it is actually like glass in the backdrop and stuff um and so when i have it it was like super super bright and it's because my reference photos i didn't realize that the reason it was super bright is because like i said it's a skylight so i had to uh fix that up change the window and stuff um so that the wall is like better you know better looking and then around that time is kind of when i was like debating do i want to start the um outdoor exhibit of the wallabies but then I was like, nah, I still have to change a few things. So uh, I took a, a second look at my wrinkled hornbill um, enclosure and I realized there's a little birdhouse in it. So I wanted to quickly, you know, throw that together. Uh, it's a small birdhouse, like literally, I'm not even sure if it could fit the hornbills in them. Um, but I'm, I'm sure it can. I'm sure they can squeeze through. They're probably just fluffy, but it's very, very tiny. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's like just this small wooden box in the corner and so I wanted to throw that in and then it's it literally looks like a domestic birdhouse that you'd find in like a uh, you know normal like backyard or something and then obviously uh, like I was saying the entire 
backdrop of the building is literally this like uh, glass wall that I somehow just totally missed. I don't know how I did the first time, but totally missed it, so I had to correct it. And then uh, just to cover up all the rocks and stuff that were in the way, I uh, then placed a ton of bamboo down so that you couldn't really see it. And then I also separated the two aviaries to be separated. So the uh, kookaburra and the um, wrinkled hornbill are separated. Um, so now we are finally getting into the outdoor portion of World of Adaptations, which is the uh, wallaby, binturong, otter, babarusa, yada, yada, yada. And outside is actually the original Australasia building sign. So I could have done one of two things. I could have just made a normal sign or I could do the thing that I did nor or, uh, you know, in this episode where I made it way too overly elaborate and extremely accurate to how it normally should. And uh, you'll see in uh, as I do this process, uh, Trico is probably going to kill me because I absolutely butcher what the continent of Australia looks like on my first try. <laughs> okay. Because um, basically this sign, uh, Dill, you, you remember it, right? Like the original? Yeah. Yes. A little bit, yeah. So this one is, I believe it's still on Google uh, Street View, if you wanted to go see it. Um, yeah, I'll pull up a picture now. It's uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, a big uh, thing. It basically, there's a, there's that glor glor glorious uh, Nick photo. Uh, um, basically, it's a map of Australasia from 18,000 years ago. And so, basically, it has, like, you know, Australia and the surrounding uh, Polynesian islands and uh, of Oceania and stuff of that nature. Um, so, stuff like uh, Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, uh, all, New Zealand, all of them, like, in one kind of giant landmass. And then, it, you know, in the little box to the left is going to be what normal Australia looks like. But as you can see... Um, this is not what Australia looks like in the slightest. <laughs> yeah. So you can see me messing up because I'm realizing at this point, I'm like, this doesn't look like Australia at all. Um, so I kind of like doctor it up a little bit. I make it a little nicer. Um, I'm adding some of the uh, gradient to it to like get the kind of sand texture uh, right. But you quickly see me, uh, I think I like modify it a bit. Um, and then I had to make an even smaller version of modern day Australia. And this is the one that I think doesn't look like Australia really, other than maybe a very minimalistic view of it. Um, yeah. but overall, I, I think, you know, it's fine looking just because I had to obviously, you know, uh, make everything so small. And a thing that I am super proud of that I did was... I, uh, there's obviously a ton of text uh, on these signs, and so I was able to actually fit this land bridge thing, and I was like, oh, cool, uh, there's no way I can do the act, and the, I was also able to do the Australasia 18,000 years ago thing using the same technique, yeah. so I have that, and this is where the current signs in the game are a real pain because you have to like mess with them perfectly to get the text to pop up but hide the um, the sign in the backdrop, so in this case, the wood. So what I ended up doing just to hide the wood in this case is I actually grabbed more gutter pieces, painted the, uh, painted the blue, and then basically just covered up the wood so it almost looked like it was part of the ocean. Um, and I think it works decently well. Um, and then the next thing, I tried typing in like a bunch of text, and then I thought of this technique. So if you ever wanted diable lines, so I know a lot of people like to use the technique of using the Planet Zoo bracket pieces and just making the little black lines. Uh, but like, this is another technique that, that I thought of uh, that, I, understandably, I understand why the brackets are easier to use, but like, I thought of this. If you literally either uh, type the word L a bunch of times or make a line, uh, using your underscore key, you can literally make like these long lines of, uh, you know, text really easily and then just kind of copy and paste them. Uh, and it obviously reduces the piece count significantly relative to e individual brackets like I know some other people do. 
Um, but yeah, I think overall the sign turned out uh, pretty well. Um, I, it, you know, it's a little taxing, but I think it, you know, is very accurate on the uh, official sign. And so, uh, yeah, I think uh, it, it just looks pretty good. You can see me messing around. I'm still trying to like figure out if I wanted to get this little corner uh, piece of text, but past that, um, it's all set. Uh, the other thing that I had to change from the original sign was uh, this. So in the original uh, sign, it's actually just a like, piece of like kind of like driftwood that has like some rope on it. So I had to modify that from the kind of newer polished, um, I guess it's like a form of like plaster or metal or something that they have on the World of Adaptation sign. But there we go. So that is the final sign. So I just placed that in. And I promise that is the last sign for this episode. Um, so now we are finally going to get into the Bennett's Wallaby habitat. Yay! Yay! So this is where it gets kind of weird because the actual wallaby enclosure is super small. Uh, or, uh, or super large, I mean for how small the wallabies are. So the wallabies, I mean, you have guys you guys have seen wallabies, of course, right? Yeah. So yeah. wallabies are uh, very, very small, like basically kangaroos. And th their habitat is probably the size of, what's the best? Probably the size of maybe the camel enclosure. <laughs> it's like the best descriptor. Um, it's really, really big for no reason. And, like, I, I have a, a feeling that if you wanted to, you could turn the current wallaby enclosure and maybe demolish, like, the the old kookaburra enclosure, which I do uh, later on. It's literally just an empty shell now with some bamboo. But it used to house the kookaburras uh, back in the day. And maybe the river otters, and you would have a plenty big enough walkabout for any Australian animals they want to throw in. Because I'm sure they're only going to get eastern gray kangaroos again, right? Like, maybe uh, emus? It, if if they get the eastern gray kangaroos, not all hope is lost for me, because that's still a... I think it's a unique species for New England. Because everywhere hey. here, we're, we were looking at this earlier, almost every single zoo has kangaroos and or wallabies. Yeah, because I know at minimum... Southwick's has both kinds. They have gray and red kangaroos. Um, I believe, uh, Franklin Park has kangaroos, yes. um, York has kangaroos, Can Capron Park has kangaroos, um, I know Animal Adventures, which I don't know if you'd really count that as a zoo, but it has Red Kangaroo, Bennett's Wallaby, and they also have a Jilly Wallaby, which they're the only one holders of that in New England, which are pretty cool. Yeah, I wanted to, like, ask about that, like, how rare Bennett's wallabies are relative to other subspecies. Um, oh, compared to anything else, at least in New England, Bennett's wallabies are everywhere. Oh, okay, because I was going to say, um, I know back in the day they had uh, Parma wallabies, which... I think those aren't found anywhere near here. Yeah, so yeah. back in back in the old days, they used to have Parma wallabies, and I don't know why they got rid of them in favor of Bennett's, but it was kind of a recent thing, because even as of, uh, like, whenever the Google Street View was taken, maybe in, like, 2015, uh, 2016, they had Parma wallabies, which is kind of weird, because, like, um, yeah, I, like, I don't know, I just feel like that's, like an odd thing that they just randomly switched to Bennett's Wallabies, almost seemingly right around the time of the kangaroo walkabout. So I don't know if that had anything to do with it. And come to think of it, I almost think that the reason for, you know, everything that happened was, um, this is, this is a conspiracy theory now, but I think that maybe the, uh, this enclosure had the Parma Wallabies, and they had Bennett's wallabies in the kangaroo walkabout, and then when though the Parma wallabies in this enclosure died, and the eastern gray kangaroos also died, they said, "Isn't it better if we just move the Bennett's wallabies to their habitat, and then from there uh, just get rid of the walkabout, and then we can start constructing the new uh, Tropical America house, which is now faces of the rainforest." Which, side note, very happy that the giant otter is coming out, because now I don't have to make it. 
Uh, in the next episode, you will see my attempt at a North American river otter. And I'll uh, leave in the comments what you guys think I might have used as the base for the otter, because I don't think any of you will guess it unless you've seen my Discord. <laughs> um, I'm also, I should also mention uh, some of the things that I did for this habitat that uh, I should probably like just point out. Um, I actually used my flexi-color rocks as the sides of the uh, enclosure. It was the first time I was using my flexi-color rocks, uh, which are on the workshop now. Uh, gonna be irrelevant soon with the new uh, aquatic DLC rocks, but you know, uh, if you want them, they're still there. And uh, I basically made them red because for some reason the zoo like has like this kind of like fake reddish pink rock, which I, I think they're trying to imitate like the Australian outback rocks, but they just don't look like real. And so instead of using the actual like outback rocks that are in the game, I made sure to like get the um, or just use my fake ones and make them like kind of pinkish. Uh, but yeah, like you can really see how large this enclosure is now. Like it's a really, really big enclosure. So big. Um, it does seem that it's a it's a trend with American zoos to make like the enclosures for the animals in Australia that don't need a lot of space have huge space. Like I've seen that the San Diego Zoo or some other zoo like that, their koala enclosure is like giant. Whereas like the only time I've seen a koala here in Australia. It's just in a small little thing with a tree and nothing else. It just seems that everyone that it's like over exaggerated as to how much space these Australian animals. Have. Yeah, because like that is like a weird thing that I've thought about, and we're coming up on the end of the video now. Um, I can kind of briefly talk about the um, the mod that I worked on. Um, it's a very difficult mod. I basically shrunk the uh, red kangaroo and gave it a black nose and made it gray. And now it's a wallaby. <laughs> I also made it a little fatter, but you know, for the most, it's it looks like a kangaroo. Please forgive me that I didn't make it like uh, super accurate to a wallaby. Uh, that was just in the interest of time. But for the uh, you know uh, rounding off this episode, uh, yeah, like yeah, I don't know. Like, so are you guys like, wh what's your opinion? Like, do you think that like you know we should be doing? what we're doing with the master plan and getting rid of the animals or like you know no no, no not at all I, I we are although i'm happy we're gaining the gray kangaroo losing the both the binturong and the barbarossa is such a big hit to the new england zoos because that's two species that are completely gone now because no there's they were the only holder of barbarossa in the area and binturong southwick's had them for like five minutes and then they didn't and <laughs> now um roger williams is the only holder and soon that won't be true so we'd have to go pretty far to see them and i don't want to go that far and that's it there's our wallaby uh so uh thank you guys for watching um in the next episode i will be doing the north american river otter and uh i don't know who will be joining me but uh thanks for watching and i'll uh, see you guys in the next video